Hello and welcome back to the commentary portion of the show. If you missed any of the major lens show, then you'll have to go back and watch that because we just talked about all of this good stuff here. It's really fun. So now this is the open commentary. We may get some questions that are still related to the lenses or we may get questions that are not, but this is just the fun little Q&A part of the show. So let's see here. We're going to start with uh, Packy's question. He says, please, or she, I'm not quite sure, uh, please give us an update on what wireless high-speed HSS high-speed strobes triggers work with the GH5 high-speed pro triggers. I've seen one using the Godox X1T Sony trigger to fire a Godox flash. Panasonic forgot this area. So you're talking about a trigger to fire the flash. You can have the flash off camera and fire the flash from camera, obviously, um, in high-speed sync mode. Hmm. I don't know. I would, you can do it with another Panasonic flash, right? So you can have two Panasonic flashes, use one of them to trigger the other one, and the flash that's on the camera does not actually have to illuminate the scene. It can be used just as a trigger, but it is admittedly a fairly expensive way to get a one camera, one flash off camera flash, if that's what you're going for. So you're seeing when you, so the Godox X1T is a third party flash that works with the Lumix cameras. Uh, you're saying you've seen a Sony one triggered, to fire Godox flash. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry to say. Um, that bears further research, and I do plan on, again, in my long list of planned things to do, do a bit more of a roundup on third-party flashes. I did a video on third-party flashes a while ago. I think it was answering a question in a Q&A, and it turns out that I was massively wrong in how many third-party flashes there were that are TTL uh, compatible uh, for the Lumix cameras. Turns out there's a lot more than I realized. I thought there was only one brand. So there's a lot more TTL flashes out there than I thought. Keeping in mind that if you don't need TTL, then you can use any flash from any manufacturer in manual mode, right? The flash hot shoe is universal, same size in every camera. You can put any flash you want on there, put it in manual mode, and off you go. But if you want TTL, if you want that automatic stuff, then you do need more advanced flashes that have TTL functions in them So um, to do that. Now, there is, Packy, one thing I will say, there is a, a radio, tri radio popper. No, is that right? I'm, I'm getting that wrong. It's not radio popper. Um, uh, crap. Uh, it's not radio popper. It's, it's, what's the other big, huge flash wireless trigger wire? I'm going to have to search for something really generic. Wireless flash trigger, because I'm totally forgetting the name. And these guys make uh, Pocket Wizard. Pocket Wizard makes a TTL wireless, radio wireless system for Panasonic flashes. So you've got that. Whether that would work with a third-party flash, I have no idea. But there is that option, so that's something to look into as well. Okay, next up, Gearsight says, I do some product photography and have always used regular lenses. Can you describe what advantage I would see from a true macro lens like you showed earlier? Well, the advantage is simply that you can get closer, a lot closer, right? If I look at my, let's see here, let's go for, so the 42 or 45 millimeter macro and let me grab a 42 and a half millimeter non-macro, not that one. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Here we go. So the 42 and a half millimeter f1.7 non-macro does this tell me the closest focusing distance on this is 0.3 meters, so a third of a meter. The closest focusing on this is 0.15 meter, so considerably closer focusing distance. If we look at a zoom lens, let's go for the good 35 to 100, the the um, the f2.8 lens, this one's, is it going to give me, it says 0.85 meter is the closest focusing distance, and that should be the same 35 to 100, I think. I think that's right. Um, so 0.85 versus 0.15, huge difference in how close you can get. And let's compare one more. Let's go for the 12 to 60, the new 12 to 60 Leica. Its closest is at telephoto range, so that's at the 60, which is kind of close, closer to the 40. It's 0.24 meters, so this one it is closer focusing than this one. Which actually, I never really compared that before. Well, that's interesting. So you can focus a lot more closely with the 12. To, well, we should compare it to the 12 to 35. Uh, okay, 12 to 35 is. Oh, okay, it's the same. 12 to 35 is a quarter of a meter. 0.25 meter. This is 0.24 meters. So the same. Uh, closest focusing. Oh, that's at the telephoto. The wide end is 0.2 meter. We'll call it the same. So somewhere between 0.2 and 0.24 is the closest focusing distance of this lens, depending on what focal length you put it at, again, compared to 0.15 on the macro. So that, that's really what it is. It's allowing you to get closer to your subject. So if you need the super close-up, then that's the one to get. If you don't need the super close-up, then you don't need the macro. Excellent. Uh, SRO is bailing on here to go vote. Well, good for you. That is certainly more important than my show. And that wasn't sarcasm. 
All right. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Oh, that's it. No other questions. You got any other questions? You got any other questions? You know what to do. There was a question that came up earlier that was, I think, that was not related to the show. If you, whoever it was, if you posted that earlier and you remember, throw it back up here and I will check it out. Um, Trevor's talking about, Trevor says macro lenses give you more options for framing. They're optimized for close focusing, of course, and they also tend to have slightly higher resolution than normal lenses. Most product photography is with macro. Oh, well, that's awesome, Trevor. Thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's a great observation on that. Um, Alexander says, how much better is the inbuilt 2X one-to-one sampling on the GH5 compared to the GH4? Is four, GH4 is this 4K on the GH5. 2K, 2X one-to-one. How much better? Hold on. How much better is the inbuilt 2X one-to-one sampling on the GH5 compared to the GH4? I don't totally understand the question. I'm sorry. Please rephrase. I'm sorry, Alexander. I'm not totally getting your question. Um, while you're rephrasing that, I'll, I'll point out something that might be what this is at least partially referenced to. On the GH4, when you shot 4K, your sensor is larger than 4K, larger pixels than 4K. So it cropped in to use exactly the... 40 the 96 is that right no uh 29 20 90, 40 90, whatever pixels across uh 3840 pixels across right that's that's what it was using out of the full 5000 4000 something whatever pixels it was on the gh4 so you weren't getting the full frame so if you put a lens on a you know 42 and a half millimeter lens on there and you're shooting regular stills or you're shooting hd video which did use the full sensor and then you flipped into 4k mode you had the 4k crop where suddenly you were you had a longer focal length because you were cropping into the shot and the, advantage, the reason that happened on the GH4 was the GH4 didn't have the processing power to downsample the full frame down to 4K. It could downsample the full frame down to 1080p, but it couldn't downsample it down to 4K. The GH5 has a much more advanced, much faster processor in it. It can downsample from the full frame down to 4K. So now with the GH5, this is one of the beautiful advantages of the GH5 over the GH4, is you are always shooting with the full frame, whether you're shooting HD or Ultra HD, so you know, 1080p or 3840 full 4K, or even cinema 4K, you are using the entire sensor and it is scaling that down. This not only gives you, you, you don't have this 4K crop annoyance, um, and the reason that was annoying is because if you set up a shot and then you switch from HD to 4K, you'd have to re reset up your shot. That's one of the many reasons it was annoying. Um, where was I going with that? So uh, in the GH5, no matter what you're shooting at, you're using the full sensor. The other thing about that is because it's scaling it down, it's downsampling, you get some subsampling in there, and so you get finer detail in the really fine things like hair, stuff like that tends to look a little bit better when it's been downsampled a little bit. So just one of those little advantages. Uh, so there's that. Uh, okay, let's see, has he rephrased the question? Alexander, you haven't rephrased yet. I need, I need, oh, okay, you're kind of doing it. Oh, inbuilt teleconverter in the 2X mode and 4X mode, better than the GH4. Okay, I don't know. I don't see why. So what he's talking about, the built-in teleconverter allows you to crop. So it's so good. It was related to what I was talking about. So I just said that the GH5 doesn't crop in. You actually can tell it to crop in. You can tell it to just use 4K pixels instead of the full width. And what that gives you is a slight push in, right? You get a slight crop or it's not full 2X though. You get a slight crop into the sensor so you get a, a little bit more range out of your telephoto but you're still shooting in full 4k if you're shooting in hd you can crop all the way so you're just using 1920 pixels wide which is i think over 2x well it has to be over 2x um, of the focal length of what you started with so you can turn a you know 100 millimeter lens into a 200 plus millimeter lens but that way how the quality is different compared to the gh4 that i don't know i mean overall the sensor is a better quality sensor you have better quality um processing all the way through. You don't have the anti-aliasing filter on the GH5 sensor. So everything about the GH5 sensor is superior to the GH4 sensor. So your image quality will be better. Whether the actual act of cropping in has changed quality-wise, I don't know, but I don't think so because all it's doing is it's not scaling, right? You're not using the scaling, so you're using the true pixels. So um, that's about the best of an answer I can give you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Does the panorama does the GH5 have a, have a panorama option? Only I can't find it. Oh, Marvin, I don't, does it have a panorama? I don't think it does. Um, 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 hold on, so let me grab it. I put the GH5 on the floor down here. Let me grab this guy. Um, I think you might be right. It might not be there. It might not be there. I'm I'm going to admit though that I'm not a massive fan of the panoramic mode. I don't think it's, it's cool, but it's not great. I would rather shoot 
a series of stills and then take them into Photoshop Lightroom, whatever, just stitch them. Um, but I, I, I don't think there is a panel mode in here. Let me just double check though. Uh, Meeting how the show does. Long story, 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 burst rate, 64K photo, post focus, self timer, progress. See, I'm not even, it's not even on my list of things to do. Um, yes, yeah, not in here. Uh, it's not even on my list of things to cover on the GH5 course, so it must not be in there. There's no panoramic position on there, so I guess not. I don't know why. Maybe because they decided that it wasn't as good as they wanted it to be, so they stopped. I'm, I'm totally speculating here, completely speculating. Uh, maybe they decided not to include it for that reason. It obviously isn't a processing power issue. The camera's got gads of processing power. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. But it does not appear to be there. But again, shoot and stitch. I did a photo. Did I ever publish that photo anywhere where you can see it in full resolution? I don't think I did. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to publish this photo today. So we'll... We'll link to it. I can link to this because I'll put it on my Photo Joseph website. If something's showing up right there, click on that. It's going to open my Photo Joseph website. I'm going to show you a picture that I did uh, that I shot when I was in uh, Republic of Georgia last year. That was a um, a stitched. I don't remember how big the resolution turned out to be. It's massive. I shot with the GX85. I think I shot with this lens, the 35 to 100, and I was up on this this viewpoint we have this huge view over the city and i just did a i think i did three rows and um i don't remember how many columns wide but a massive amount of of photos and then threw them into lightroom and said panorama this and it put it all together automatically it's phenomenal you have this massive file you can zoom way into it's not quite gigapixel but it's a huge file and that works so well it works so well. Lightroom slash Photoshop is so good at stitching those things together and not leaving funky artifacts and analyzing things that are moving and merging them together so you don't get you know weird things happening. It's not perfect. I mean, you do you can still get weird things happening, but um, it's a, it's impressive. It really is. So look for that link. I will upload that picture at some point today to my Photo Joseph website so you guys can see that because it's really it's super cool. Alrighty, um, oops, scrolled off screen, where'd it go? Okay, Gear Size says, thank you for the macro explanation. The ones you use for comparison are the ones I use the most. Awesome. Kevin Wright, can you recommend lenses for use with a follow focus? The eternally spindling focus by wire thing makes focus marks a bit of a joke. Right. Um, yeah, cinema lenses, true cinema lenses. I mean, uh, you know, lenses by Cook, uh, lenses with true mechanical focus rings. What he's talking about is most of these lenses, probably all of these actually, have, um, it's kind of, it's drive by wire, focus by wire. So this is the focus ring. It never stops spinning, right? There's no mechanical positioning between the uh, focus, close focus to far focus. And what that means on some lenses is that when you spin the focus ring quickly, quickly, it'll, it'll rack the focus very quickly. As you turn it more slowly, it actually slows down so you can get more precise focusing. It's, it takes a little getting used to, but it's really, really cool once you get used to it and the, the, just knowing that you have that. But if you are trying to do focus marks, focus from A to B, and you want to manually focus crank, it doesn't work. So you can kind of do it if you're careful and slow and you get the same kind of, same kind of speed motion, but it's not super precise. Um, keep in mind the GH5 does have that focus transition feature. I actually just recorded the video for that for the GH5 training the other day. It is so cool. I mean, that is such a cool feature. I realize it's not everything that a true cinematographer needs, but it is it is close. It, it does a lot of stuff in there that's really, really cool. So you can check that feature out if you got a GH5. Um, so anyway, so you need mechanical lenses. You know, like my, that Zhongyi lens. Nope, nope, where'd it go? Oh, let's put it over here. The Zhongyi lens, this is mechanical, right? You can hear it as it gets to one end of the focal focal range to the other. That's a mechanical lens. So this lens, when it's here, it is always exactly at whatever that focus point is. Um, you can't see the Sanford driver wire. So yeah, unfortunately, I think it means non-Panasonic lenses, because as far as I know, all of the Panasonic Lumix lenses are focused by wire, as far as I know. Uh, Sean Miner says, does the new Leica lineup, the 8 to 18 upcoming 50 to 200, share the same fly-by-wire focusing speed curve? The 12 to 60 isn't very good for manual focusing while shooting video. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to assume that it is, but you said the 12 to 60 isn't very good for manual focusing while shooting video. Huh. I haven't run into that, but I guess I haven't really done that much manual focusing with that lens to be fair. So, um, 
Interesting observation. But I would guess it's going to have the same one. I've, I know there have been requests to Panasonic before to give users some control over that, and I haven't heard any way or another whether that's anything that's happening or not. It seems like it'd be a good idea, though, because it is drive-by-wire, focus-by-wire. You can, technically, the user can make all kinds of decisions about how fast it focuses, what it does, uh, whether there's ramping or not. But that control is not in anything that I'm aware of, um, but that would be good. All right, now we're running long today. Kevin Wright says, that said, the whole setup should be very amenable to a Bluetooth remote follow focus, care dropping a hint to Panasonic. Oh, oh believe me, we've talked about this sort of thing. Um, Graham Cooper, Kevin Wright, uh, Kevin Wright, Kevin, oh, that was Kevin Wright. Is that my Kevin Wright? My buddy Kevin Wright? Probably, since Graham's giving him a hard time now. Kevin Wright, very good question. Non-stepped aperture lenses seem like a good idea for video also, or am I wrong? You are, you're absolutely right, Graham. If you are shooting video and you want to change aperture while shooting video, you have to have a stepless aperture. Otherwise, you'll see the exposure change in steps. I actually showed this just last week. We'll link to that one up here. Uh, I did a video about the real estate shoot that I had just done, and it was specifically about the variable aperture that is in some of the newer lenses, and it turns out it's in more than just this 12 to 60. It's in a couple other lenses as well, where if the camera is in automatic aperture mode, it will smoothly close that aperture ring down. Unfortunately, when you step it manually, it still steps. And I have talked to Panasonic about that. I would like to see that change because clearly there's no advantage to having it step. Um, and when you're shooting video, it obviously makes it unusable. You can't have your exposure changing like that. But if you can, vary, if you can change the uh, aperture manually, and have that be a smooth ramp, that would be very good. So the way it is now, if you have it set to shutter priority or, um, or yeah, well, shutter priority, and so the aperture is changing automatically, the camera will stop down or open up the aperture and do it smoothly so you get that smooth transition. So, so watch that video that I already pointed to, and you'll see examples of it, and I do it both ways. You'll see I did it manually, and then you'll see it automatically. Um, the other advantage, the other uh, alternative is to use something like Again, coming back to my Zhongyi lens, this aperture is is uh, mechanical and stepless. So it's you can hear there's no there's no steps happening in there. It's super smooth, and it is smooth. It's it's really nice. When I first got this lens, it had a a, a hitch in it. It would kind of stick at one point, and I almost returned it. But then I realized after I played with it for a little bit that it was smooth. It just had to kind of kind of break through that that little hitch. Probably the grease had gotten a little clumped up or something in there. So um so there's that. All right, hopefully that answers your question, Mr. Graham. All right, let's see what else is in here. Let's go ahead and bring this chat back up. Ah, flew after Sean Miter, I really like that Olympus offers the manual focus option, but really want to stick with the native Lumix glass. Uh, Sean, is the Olympus manual focus not focused by wire? Um, I'm not familiar with it. Please tell me. Marvin P.A., get an affinity, if so hope it can be done there. Uh, oh, the stitching, the panoramic you're talking about, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, even the iOS version, I haven't tried it yet, but even the iOS version has it, which is insane. So I haven't tried it yet, so I cannot compare it to Lightrooms but, or Photoshop's, but um, the feature's in there. And everything else I've seen from Affinity, has, uh, Photo has been awesome, so let's hope that it does. Kevin Wright says, are we heading down the wrong path here? Is Photo just contractually forbidden from discussing non-panel lenses? No, I am not. I, my, my charter is to prefer, you know, when, when, when possible, talk about the Panasonic lenses. Um, in general, this is why I said in the beginning of this that I will avoid lenses that are identical to the Panasonic lenses that are from other manufacturers because I'm going to tell you you should get the Panasonic. And, you know, you can take that for what it's worth. I, generally, the Panasonic lens, especially the Leica ones, they are some of the best out there, so this is awesome, short of getting into some crazy Cine Cook lenses that are thousands and thousands of dollars. But if you're talking about a lens that is not available from the Panasonic lineup, then that's totally fair game. Um, I will, if I know of a lens, I generally, I don't even look into them, but if I know of a lens or I'm told of a lens that, uh, that somebody else makes, let's just say that someone else made a 42.15 f1.2 lens, uh, odds are, you know, the extent of what I would do on, here, on this show is I'd tell you that it's available and tell you to go check it out, but um, I wouldn't do a side-by-side -side comparison of them just because, again, I don't compare like to like when we're talking about non-Panasonic stuff which is why I don't do camera reviews, don't do Sony camera reviews, Nikon reviews, and so on. That's just not what I do. I am, uh, yeah, I'm sponsored by Panasonic, and that's how that works. So hopefully that answers your question, Kevin. Uh, Pecky says, 
feel that you should do color grading or LUTs in the future? Yeah, yeah, that's, that is definitely on the list as well. I was amazed at this 3D LUT creator video demo. Panasonic, please give the Vlog L for free. Well, that's not going to happen, but I will do, uh, I will do color grading and LUT stuff. That's, that's a huge area of knowledge that I have yet to completely attain and absorb. I need to, um, I've started the research on that. I've got Vlog installed on my GH5, um, but I still have a lot to learn there. So it's going to be a while before I get into that. All righty. Um, Kevin says, is it true stepless or is it just going in smaller increments? I know the intermediate ISO is a configurable option. Can't recall if it's possible for Iris though. If you're talking about the, the lens, the 12 to 60, it is true stepless. You'll see it. You can see it's totally smooth. There is no stepping going on in there. And then a lens like this, the mechanical one, is also truly stepless. There's no, you can feel it when you rotate it. There's, there's nothing stopping it. It feels just like the focus ring, which can be a bit of a it's actually probably one complaint about this lens. There's no easy way to tell the difference between them. And unless you are super familiar with the lens, it's really easy to grab the aperture ring instead of the focus ring. So that's one problem with this lens. All right. Graham, the only, uh, the only Olympus Pro lenses have hard stops in manual focus mode. Just pull back the focus ring to switch to manual. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, the, the Panasonic lenses don't do that. Okay. Well, I will have to check that out someday. All right, guys, that's it. We are going to knock it off there. Once again, thanks for tuning in. You know the routine. If you aren't subscribed, please subscribe. If you like the video, thumbs up. And if you don't like it, you, you just, just don't do anything. No, you can thumbs down, but tell me why. Um, but do, do thumbs up. This is, you know, if you're not watching this live, this is a separate video. If you're watching this live, you've already thumbs up. Great. If you haven't, if you forgot to, please go do that now. We like the thumbs up. It helps out everywhere. Uh, let's see. Let's just talk about what we want to throw. One more slide. Let's throw, let's throw up this. I haven't done this in a while. Let's remind you all that if you are watching this and wondering what the heck a lot of the terms are that we're talking about here, do check out my Linda Photography 101 course. You can, there's a shortcut to it, photojoseph.com slash photo 101. That'll take you right to it. If you are not a Linda subscriber yet, you can get a 10-day free trial by going to photojoseph.com slash Linda. That'll redirect you to the Linda page where you can get a 10-day free trial and you can watch my entire course in 10 days and then cancel. I'm, you know, Please don't, but you can. You absolutely can. There's nothing stopping you from doing that if you just want to get your hands on some of the training and check it out. I've got a lot of different Linda uh, courses up on Linda, so do check those out. But that Photo 101, that's one of my latest, and I love it. And that course came out really good. I'm proud of that one. Um, it's super fun. Graham says, very, very good show. I thank you, Mr. Graham. I do appreciate that. You are quite welcome. All right, you guys, that's it. I'm out of here. Ha what is today? Today's Thursday, so we've still got another day before the weekend. Enjoy yourselves. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.